All right, so I'll be talking about a relatively unexplored geoengineering mechanism, uh, namely cirrus cloud seeding. Uh, and the purpose of cirrus cloud seeding would be to reduce the strong greenhouse effect that these cirrus clouds have. And so note that this type of geoengineering does not uh, uh, target short wave radiation, it targets long wave radiation, so it doesn't fit under the traditional SRM uh, umbrella. And so uh, how will we achieve this reduction in uh, cirrus uh, cloud greenhouse effect? This schematic uh, illustrates what the purpose of the cirrus seeding would be. So we would uh, start by, uh, start with clouds uh, like the one on the left hand side here that has um, many small ice crystals. And the purpose of the seeding would be to convert the cirrus clouds from this type of cloud to clouds that consist of few but large ice crystals that would sediment out and thereby reduce cirrus cloud coverage in, in lifetime. And this uh, geoengineering mechanism was proposed the, for, for the first time in 2009 by Mitchell and Finnig uh, Finnegan. And uh, they suggested that if we seeded cirrus clouds with very efficient ice nuclei, we could actually achieve this transition from the cloud on the left to the cloud on the right and thereby cool climate. And so to explain how that could actually come about, I need to review how uh, ice crystals form in cirrus clouds. And so they can form uh, through two different ice nucleation mechanisms. So there's homogeneous nucleation in which uh, solution droplets in the upper troposphere, which there are many of, uh, can free spontaneously if the supersaturation is high enough. So a supersaturation of about 50% or higher would allow for uh, homogeneous ice nucleation. And because there are many of these solution droplets, you would create the type of cloud that has uh, many small ice crystals. But ice crystals can also form by heterogeneous ice nucleation, and that can happen when you have uh, so-called ice nuclei present. And when you have these ice nuclei present, you can actually form ice crystals at much lower supersaturations. Uh, and when that occurs, you have ice crystal growth uh, on, uh, for the ice crystals that form on these ice nuclei, and you can that way prevent homogeneous ice nucleation. And when that occurs, you typically have a cloud with few but large ice crystals because ice nuclei are, are rare in the atmosphere. But because ice nuclei are rare in the atmosphere, uh, there's reason to believe that oftentimes there are not enough of these ice nuclei to really suppress homogeneous nucleation and that quite a few of the cirrus clouds that form uh, in the current atmosphere are actually formed by homogeneous uh, ice nucleation and therefore look like the top image here. So the idea then is that we could introduce artificial ice nuclei and that, that way uh, convert the clouds from looking like the top schematic to the, the bottom schematic in this case. And so uh, a couple of years ago, we tested this for the first time in a global climate model. And the model that we used was the NCAR CAM5 with a modified CERS parametrization following Barahona and Nanis' work. And we, uh, tried a lot of different concentrations in the upper troposphere for artificial ice nuclei uh, without specifying exactly what they were, but just saying that they were very uh, efficient forming ice crystals at 10% supersaturation. And we could in fact get this desired effect of a strong reduction in ice crystal number concentration, therefore the ice crystals got larger in the upper troposphere and they sedimented out more rapidly and therefore we got a lot less ice in the upper troposphere and uh, reduction in cirrus cloud coverage. And in terms of what kind of cooling that got, the next slide shows that. And it also shows that this choice of uh, uh, a seeding concentration of 15 per liter was not a random choice. We actually uh, injected lots and lots of different concentration of seeding ice nuclei in the upper troposphere and looked at what kind of cooling effect we could get. So I'm showing now on the y-axis the change in cloud forcing, so a negative value uh, corresponds to a cooling. Uh, and so if you focus on the red curve now at the beginning, you can see that we have this interesting uh, Goldilocks uh, situation where if we put relatively low uh, concentrations of artificial IN in the upper troposphere, nothing really happens with the cirrus clouds. So there's not enough of the artificial ice nuclei to suppress homogeneous nucleation. And you, you get no effect, a, a wasted seeding effort, if you will. And then there's this, uh, these, this range of concentrations that, that is just right. And when you get, get it just right, you suppress homogeneous nucleation and you form 
these uh, cirrus clouds that consist of few but large ice crystals. And with that, you get a strong cooling because you're now reducing the greenhouse effect of the cirrus clouds. And then, in turn, when you get to high concentrations of ice nuclei, you get to an overseeding uh, regime where, when now you're you're not uh, you're you're warming the climate instead of the intentional cooling that you, you uh, <coughs> wanted. Uh, and I should note that oops, I'm sorry. Uh, so these other uh, these other two curves represent uh, sensitivity simulations where we varied the treatment of of upper tropospheric uh, vertical velocities or turbulence, if you will. And you can see that exactly the 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 right concentration of ice nuclei depends on is very dependent on uh, upper tropospheric dynamics. So that's an important takeaway message. But you could get a lot of cooling was, a take, uh, was another takeaway from this study. You could get a lot of cooling if you got the seeding IN concentration just right. Now one big assumption that we did, uh, that we made for this study was that in the un unseeded atmosphere, all cirrus clouds form by homogeneous ice nucleation. And we now know from field studies that that's not uh, a correct assumption. So we relaxed that assumption in follow-up studies and we also decomposed the radiative effect into a long wave and a short wave effect, and I'm showing the zonal mean long wave and short wave effects here. And the different curves represent to degrees of relaxation of this assumption of, of homogeneous nucleation. And you can see that you, you can get a lot of cooling even if you relax that uh, assumption. You also see in this figure that uh, the desired long wave effect, the reduction in greenhouse effect, uh, mainly happens at uh, mid to high latitudes. And then there's this undesired compensation in the short wave because you're also reducing the albedo of these clouds, and that mainly happens in the tropics. So looking at these plots, it became obvious to us right away that if we wanted to go ahead and, uh, and do cirrus seeding, we shouldn't be targeting low latitudes. We sh really should be targeting uh, mid or high latitudes. So in a follow-up uh, fully coupled climate simulation, we, um, we took that into account, and so now we made the cirrus seeding a function of the solar zenith angle, and we decided only to seed cirrus clouds at high solar zenith angle, so really only where there is polar night or close to polar night. And these uh, functions here correspond to two different seeding strategies. One uh, uh, corresponds to seeding only 45% of the globe, the, the 45 darkest percent of the globe, uh, at any given time, and the other one corresponds to seeding only the 15% darkest parts of the, the globe at any given time. And this table here summarizes the global mean uh, effects of cirrus seeding for the, the fully coupled climate simulations. And uh, you can see that you get a stronger perturbation in the long wave. So this is the change in long wave cloud forcing when you seed more of the globe, but you also get more of a compensation in the short wave when you seed more of the globe and you seed the more of the lower latitudes. So the net is that not really that different. And interestingly, these two different seeding strategies, one, one where you seed 45% of the globe and the other where you seed 15% of the globe, achieve exactly the same cooling. So we thought that was a very interesting finding. And obviously, you would go for the 15% if you were ever to implement this. Um, so now going deeper into the climate response, you can see here the the, the the surface cooling that we could uh, achieve with this uh, cirrus seeding. Uh, and you can see that there's a strong polar amplification. And if you do the, the ratio of high latitude to um, global cooling, you get a ratio of 2.5, which is actually very similar to the kind of polar amplification you see from a greenhouse warming. So in that sense, this is probably a better compensation for CO2 warming than some of the SRM techniques that tend to overcool the tropics and, and undercool the high latitudes. In terms of the vertical uh, temperature changes, we can see that there's a cooling happening throughout the troposphere and then a warming in the stratosphere. So again, that mirrors what happens uh, in response to increased CO2 concentrations. So uh, of opposite sign, but otherwise very similar to the, the vertical temperature response to increased uh, CO2. And that just indicates the difference between the troposphere and the stratosphere. All right, so uh, now to the precipitation changes that we see from this type of geoengineering. Uh, the figure on the left here now uh, shows changes in total precipitation rate in response to the seeding. 
And you can see that there's a lot of hatching, and whenever there's a hatching, there's not a statistical significant uh, change in precipitation. But whenever there is a statistically significant change, it looks like there's a pattern of wet gets drier and dry gets wetter. So again, something that is uh, a, a very good compensation for what we see in response to CO2 increase. And uh, also in the global mean, there's a relatively modest reduction in rainfall uh, of 1.3% per Kelvin of cooling, which is more modest than what you typically see for solar radiation management. And finally, looking at the zonal mean changes in precipitation minus evaporation, we've compared what we modeled to the, the classical thermodynamic scaling by Soda and Held from a few years back. And we can see that most of the changes can be explained by thermodynamics, but there's also a dynamics part of it, and that is uh, explained by a shift in the ITZ, ITZZ because there's more cooling in the southern hemisphere. The southern hemisphere uh, cirrus clouds are more susceptible in the first place, and there's more of a sea ice feedback happening in the southern hemisphere as well. So that's where the hemispheric asymmetry comes from. <coughs> and with that, I'm at my conclusion. So seeding of cirrus clouds has the potential to cool climate by about 1.4 degrees uh, C. And we can get the same kind of cooling uh, by seeding only 15% of the globe uh, at only high latitudes as we get when we seed as much as 45% of the globe. Um, and cirrus seeding would likely not delay the recovery of the ozone layer like uh, stratospheric aerosols would. There's, not a, there's no additional surface for chemical reactions to occur on in the stratosphere, and the, the stratosphere also um, warms. Uh, and and uh, additionally, uh, because cirrus seeding targets long wave radiation and not short, short wave radi radiation, it is in many ways a better compensation for increased greenhouse gases. For example, this feature of what gets drier and drier gets wetter. And I want to end with the, the many unknowns and caveats that, uh, that still remain for this type of geoengineering. So, so far most of the work has, has been done with one single GCM, so a lot more uh, models should be used to look at this problem. Um, the unperturbed state of cirrus clouds, so whether cirrus clouds in the first place form mainly by homogeneous or heterogeneous nucleation, is not very well understood, so we need more field work or potentially satellite observations that can, uh, can, can shed light on that. And it's not entirely clear how you would build up this optimal seeding concentration. So even if you knew exactly what the, the seeding ice nuclei concentration should be, it's not obvious how you would achieve that. People have proposed uh, drones or commercial aircraft, but that's still an unanswered que uh, question. And finally, uh, whatever the seeding ice nuclei end up being, we need to worry about the, the environmental fate and toxicity of that seeding material. So with that, I'd like to end and take any questions. So we have plenty of time. Uh, Steve? Yeah, great, great talk. I have a question about the optimal seeding concentration. So ideally, you want all of your ice nuclei concentrations to be uniform in your seeding zone. And, and these tend to be coarser particles just it's not going to be easy to achieve that. Hmm. How would you design an experiment to test for um, you know, the heterogeneity of, of the seeding? Yeah, I, I agree. I think so far the mo our modeling experiments have been very idealized in this respect. And I, I want to do some particle dispersion modeling to try to answer this. I'm not sure, but I think it's a critical question. For example, if you were to disperse the material with drones, how far apart would the drones have to fly? Because if they have to be very uh, close, uh, that it becomes non-viable, I think. Um, so that, I think, is a, an important next question to, a question to answer. Yeah. I guess maybe in the back, back in the next. Yeah. You, you do get global changes even though the seeding uh, happens only at high latitudes because you, you get worldwide, worldwide cooling and you, go, yet you get um, hemispheric asymmetry and all these things that, that contribute to changes in, in precipitation. So what I showed was actually for only high latitude seeding. Yeah, 
Yeah, so, so uh, in the model itself, I, I think the, the parameterization that I'm using is sort of the state of the, state of the art right now, but it, 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 you know, it's a field of rapid development, so I think things are changing and, and being improved all the time. I think m there's more of an uncertainty related to what, what the state of natural cirrus clouds uh, are right now. So we really don't have a good understanding of how cirrus clouds form in the first place in various places in the world. So I think that's perhaps a more important question to address. All right, and okay. I think in the interest of time, I should introduce uh, David Mitchell, who will be talking about something very different. He'll be talking about the ethical aspects of geoengineering, so that will be interesting. All right.